Welcome everyone. Thank you all to coming to this webinar. My name is Iris Vika and I'm a business development and licensing associate here at the Center for Technology Licensing at Wall Cornell Medicine. We are the tech transfer office for the Academic Medical College at Cornell University. CTL is responsible for managing the intellectual property and commercialization partnerships for all the technologies developed by university and medical faculty on our campus, as well as our trainees. Um, CTL is also part of a larger organization called Wall Cornell Medicine Enterprise Innovation, which provides education, programming, training, and mentorship to innovators who are interested in the commercialization journey. Today, we have our next installment of the special panel series, which is a series of webinars where we bring together panels of experts to address opportunities and challenges in the path towards commercialization. Today, we are going to be addressing opportunities and challenges specifically related to commercializing tangible materials and other research tools. I think we're all familiar with the fact that research tools, whether it be cell lines, mouse models, reagents, probes, organoids, are regularly generated in the course of research. While many of these are primarily used for academic purposes, some of these have the potential to be commercialized for use by other researchers, um, companies, or even spun into new ventures or startups to offer these tools as a service. So it's quite an expansive field, um, but there are also numerous challenges with researchers and entrepreneurs um, when they're trying to commercialize these tools. So today is a great opportunity to talk about some of the ways which we can commercialize these tangible materials, as well as some of the pitfalls and challenges to watch out for in order to fully leverage these opportunities. So you can ask questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We will try to address these at the end of the panel discussion today. Also at the end of the panel, you'll receive a questionnaire. We'd appreciate if you could take a few minutes to fill that out so that we can build better contact that meets the needs of our audience. And with that, I would like to welcome our panel and give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. So I'd like to start with Karen Wu. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. So my name is Karen Wu. I am the president and co-founder of Lucerna. It's a technology actually spun out of Cornell University. So uh, my background is I got my PhD from pharmacology at the Sami Jaffrey lab at Wild Cornell back, I guess, over, I can't remember what, what year it is. But uh, we developed this technology called spinach. And after my postdoc, I want to do something that's involved more entrepreneurship. So me and my co-founder, co Sami Jaffrey, we discussed this technology and we we uh, we did a lot of research and realized there's a lot of um, at commercial aspect with this technology. So we said it's spawn out this technology out of Cornell. We licensed this technology from Cornell. And then since then we have, we've spawned a company since then we developed RNA imaging products that people, researchers can buy and also high throughput assays. And then also a pipeline for developing custom assay development for pharmaceutical companies. Great, thank you. Jamie? Yes, hello, Jamie Holberg, uh, Head of External Innovation Licensing at Millipore Sigma. I've been with the company for about 16 years. I uh, and my team primarily work with academic institutions and identify licensing uh, new technology opportunities, particularly those that are sold for, for research use only. Uh, prior to that, I had a um, uh, two, three years at the, the Harvard Office of Technology Development in, in licensing. So, um, yeah, please, please to be here and look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you. Chuck? Hello, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Chuck Na. I'm the uh, manager of innovation at ATCC, the global bio repository. Uh, much like Jamie, I work on the external innovation side, identifying technologies, materials, and other kinds of um, opportunities to ingest and put into the ATCC catalog. Uh, I've been here at ATCC for about three years. Uh, before this, I worked in tech transfer policy for NIST uh, in the Department of Commerce. And then before that, I've had a long, uh, uh, a large amount of my career was spent doing what IRIS does uh, in tech transfer at universities and in federal laboratories. So pleasure being here. Great, thanks Chuck. And Peter? Well, uh, good day to you all. Uh, thank you for coming. My name's Peter Wells. I work for the Jackson Laboratory and mainly in the contracts area. And I've been with them for about 20 years. And most of the work I do is connected with the tech transfer, the commercial use of mouse models. Now, Jackson is primarily a research institution. We're a nonprofit research institution. But what we're known for is this uh, huge repository of mouse models of uh, research and development. 
There's about 13,000 different models in there, and about half of them require a license for commercial use. So there's a lot of work to do when the mice come in and when they go out, keep all, keeping all the rights and obligations straight. And that's mainly my area of expertise. Thank you. Great, thank you all for, for joining. Um, so I'd like to start off with some context for the value of tangible materials from a commercial perspective. So research tools and tangible materials are generated constantly in an academic setting. Many or most of these will remain in academic labs where they originated, but some of these will go on to have commercial success. Um, Jamie, I know at your role at EMD Millipore, you're constantly evaluating academic generated materials. What are some of the considerations that you take into mind when thinking about whether an academic tool could have commercial potential? Yeah, thanks. Great question. And the first thing that we look at is whether or not um, the particular reagent has been published or not. That's actually usually a, you know, a, a starting point in terms of a uh, decision point about whether or not we would want to want to want to license it. And the reason is, is we have a huge catalog, as you as you probably know, and we necessarily have account managers, salespeople reaching out to labs with our catalog. So that publication you know, coupled with, you know, Google searches and such is, you know, an important, um, you know, method tool that, you know, we can use to to gain gain market attraction. Other things that we look at are things like um, publication trends. Uh, we look at the applications of the reagent. We look at what it compares to existing, you know, products out there, what our what our own portfolio is 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 offering us. Um, and of course, whether or not we can, you know, manufacture it in as well is an important consideration. But going back to the initial, it's the it's the publications that really matter. Because when we put that product on our on our webpage, we can list the publication associated with it. And so our customers know um that that it's that material, particularly if it has a like an example of a monoclonal antibody, unique clone name associated with it. And so customers know it's from so-and-so's lab at, at Cornell University, for example. So um, many ways, but again, the, the publications. Great. Yeah, thank you for that overview. Certainly seems that the, the publication is an important thing to have in mind for our researchers. Um, Karen, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, you started out in an academic setting working on the research tool, which then on became went on to become the basis for your startup. Um, could you speak about, about what made you realize that the tool that you were working on had commercial potential in your journey leaving the university to work on translating this technology to the market? Sure, yeah. So as I mentioned before, I, I uh, did my PhD in the Jaffe lab at, at Cornell. And my thesis at that time was to look at the role of local RNA trafficking and translation in a spinal cord injury. So for that, all my work is around RNA, studying RNA, see how, where it goes, what it does. And then I use a variety of commercial tools at, at that time to study RNA, including in situ for instance, in situ hybridization of fish. And I realized at doing while doing the research, there's actually at that time very few good tools or, or, or tool that's not time consuming or uh, or um, labor intensive. Like for example, fish, it technically it literally takes three days to twice to do a, 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 a experiment to do image and RNA. And that's just so much time, it's not dynamic. So we are just a lot of which from doing my doing research, I realized a lot of a uh, lot of challenge in the, the tool that we have right now and a lot of um things that are missing. So that's why we developed a, a technology called spinach, which is RNA, a fluorescent RNA technology that allows people to image RNA in living cells. So you can do it in real time, that you can look at different time points over a period. So we just so if it's from doing research and realizing what are the missing values that's currently out in the market right now. So we develop technology to solve that pain, I guess, that, that a researcher like me had. So that's how we, we developed the technology. And as we did this, we realized that we then we started exploring what else can we use this spinach for. It's just RNA sequence that can tag to anything. So we compared to a green fluorescent, the RNA version of green fluorescent protein. And we know how much green for the fluorescent protein have changed how we uh, study protein. So we know we can use similar model and look at different market that, that this technology can apply to. And yeah, so we, after doing some market research, we realized that we, there is a potential there. There is a, a need, there's a lot of pain. So we, I, I, we wrote some SVR grant, got the funding and got, and then started a company there from there. Great. Yeah, thank you for walking us through that journey. And certainly seems that your own experience in the lab um, was crucial to identifying that 
that unmet need. Um, I'd like to turn now to some of the issues which we might not think about as we're generating research tools, but are important for being able to commercialize them later on. Um, the first among these would be freedom to operate and ownership issues. So one of the main challenges we face with sharing tangible materials is determining if we actually have the ability and the rights to transfer or license material. Um, Jamie and Peter, I know that you both deal with ownership and FTO issues as you deal with different types of research tools. Um, could you talk a little bit about the complexities and ownership of tangible materials and how this can interfere with sharing, especially with for-profit industry partners? Peter, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, for, um, <clears throat> for MICE, there's sort of three things we have to look at. MICE is submitted to Jackson Laboratory all the time. And um, almost all the mice in our collection come from other institutions. So we have to track down who actually made the mouse compared to who's submitting it to Jackson. You have to go back and find which lab it was made in. The second thing is you have to find out if there's any other proprietary elements in the mouse. They may have taken an existing mouse with a knockout, for example, and then built on that. And there may be uh, rights surrounded around the original uh, mutation in the mouse. And the third thing is, what intellectual property tools we use to make the mouse. The use of the CRISPR-Cas9 system is ubiquitous in all of the biosciences and is used a lot uh, to modify mice these days. So those are the three things we look for. And from, from our side, very similar. It depends what the particular reagent is. If it's a plasmid, say, for example, that oftentimes includes sequences, say, from our competitors that might be inserted in there, maybe a tag, for example. Um, cell lines the same way. There could be some some other IP, or moreover, if it's a cell line, um, a human cell line, you know whether or not there's patient consent is a is a is a is a big consideration uh, in that regard. If it's an antibody, sometimes there's special reagents that people can use that really help with immunization of those. If it's a uh, you know. Um, a, uh, a media uh, formulation. Um, it could be a special, you know, chemical reagent that's in there that's that that's patented by some other party. So that's just part of our normal diligence that we have to take into consideration when we're when we're um, you know looking to license these uh, these these technologies. Yeah, great. And then something else that comes to mind, I guess, is organoids are particularly hot sp space right now for academics and industry alike. Um, could you speak to some of the IP complexities in the space that you're you're dealing with? Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very fast and, and growing space. Um, you know, we we certainly have to take into consideration, um, you know, uh, whether or not there's any foundational IP that we even need to take a license uh, to. And take that into into consideration. It's not just not just us uh, necessarily, but also you know our, our researchers as well. Is that if they're creating something that they want to commercialize, that need, needs to be taken into into consideration as well. So it's a very very complex, uh, competitive uh, space. And yeah, we we we've done our diligence, and we feel like we're we're good with where we're, where we are at a company, what we're offering in the organoid space. But it's it's ever evolving and very and very fast moving for sure. Great. Yep. Thank you. Thanks to you both for sharing these aspects of some of the things that you're considering. I guess from the perspective of an academic researcher, um, what consideration should we be taking into account when constructing a material which could potentially have commercial applications later on? Maybe Chuck wants to take that on. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for calling on me. Um, actually, I, I want to take one step back because I realized when we were talking about the value of tangible materials, you, you asked the two commercial entities. And there is a different, uh, a slightly different calculus for us in the, the nonprofit uh, sector. Um, we're a little bit more agnostic toward the, the ultimate use and utility of it, because for, for us, there's a certain amount of making research to, tools broadly available in order to help facilitate science. Now, private sector does it as well, but they have a calculus that they have to, to, to undertake, which is, you know, before they put in the necessary investment to turn it into a successful commercial product, you know, they, they have to think more along the lines of what are the costs that are going to be associated with taking something to market. 
at ATCC, you know, we work as an open repository where uh, researchers, if they get, you know, requests from, from, from folks once they publish, you know, about their cell lines or their bacteria or, or even some of their components, you know, we will take on the cost of, of manufacturing that material and providing that quality authenticated material out to the world. Um, now, you know, the, the commercializers actually have a, 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 an advantage in that they're able to kind of have a more broad use of, of, the, of the IP or the commercial use kind of rights. We have, to, we have a harder time negotiating some of those commercial rights, especially if there's background IP related to it. So from our aspect or from our perspective, for researchers, we just want you guys to be aware and document what materials you're using as your source so that we can do that freedom to operate uh, assessment. Um, for, for ATCC, we get thousands of submissions every year and we have to be a little picky sometimes um, when there's a thicket of IP that we have to work through and get licenses uh, for in order to distribute. It becomes too encumbered and um, it's hard for us to kind of sustain that public good mission. Um, now, if there's a huge upside, Jamie, you guys might take that plunge, right? Because that license may end up um, enabling you to make a pretty big profit if there's that huge demand there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that makes sense. And and I think that's something that came up a lot was um, background intellectual property and IP that uh, might be a consideration. So sort of going towards that line, talking about intellectual property, um, at Wild Cornell, we have some tangible materials which are protected by patents and others which are not. Um, I guess, could you speak a little bit about the value of intellectual property protection for research tools? Um, is it necessary in all instances and sort of what is the value there? Yeah, I can, I can comment on that one uh, for sure. So I would say that we, we certainly take uh, intellectual property patents associated with all of our products very seriously. So that's that's first and foremost. With that being said, um, you know, we it's not always the the top line in terms of, you know, why we would or would not move forward with uh, with a license. And, uh, and a perfect example of that would be um, a, a perfect example of why a patent would not be useful to us uh, would be like um, a hybridoma cell line, for say, for example. Let's say, for example, a very, very one of a kind hybridoma cell line is created. It's like the only one in the world. And maybe the researchers even got lucky by making it and they file a patent on it. It goes through the patent process. It's got an issued patent and everything is, is great. But then one day the freezer breaks down and you lose that hybridoma, but you have the patent. Well, you ask yourself this question for us, what's the value of the patent? Well, there isn't one really. Yeah, you could try to remake, but maybe you're not going to get that that special that special reagent. So, that's always the example I give when I when I when, when I get this question. So, um, I mean, but again, it's not to say that you know we don't take licenses to patents. We absolutely do. Um, but that just gives you an example of you know why a patent would not be useful to us when the hybridoma is is gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I guess, so you have the material and then you also have like the know-how for generating the material. Could you talk a little bit about the value of that and if any types of know-how are most valuable for commercializing those materials? Yeah, sure. I, I can I can comment again. Uh, feel free to jump in, Chuck, not, uh, Chuck Peter, and, and Karen. So yeah, that's, you know, in many cases, you know, going back to the patent discussion, the know-how is more valuable than a patent would be. Um, a lot of times we sell products, we don't tell our customers actually what's in it or how we make it. So that's know-how and it's not protected by a patent. So we have numerous, um, you know, products in our catalog that fall into this category. So um, yeah, no, what's in the researchers, you know, uh, brain, if you will, is and how they do it, you know, is is very very competitive uh, information for us. Yeah, and and I think to expand on that, there's there's different categories of IP that you can break out, and then you can assign a a, a kind of relative value to each thing. So as as Jamie talked about, you know, there's 
patents that you can get for a hybridome or some sort of specific research tool that would have limited application for or limited use because you know a patent is there just to kind of exclude others from commercializing or or, or practicing it um that for us in the consumables market right it's it's not really that necessary however i think karen could speak to the fact that like intellectual property in the the tangible materials there is absolutely required as they're kind of building up this startup and 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 raising capital and and building on a platform um i think that there are patents that your researchers could generate toward um methods of manufacturing or uh different kinds of platform technologies where you could even almost split off the value, right? There's tangible materials that folks like ATCC or uh, Jackson Lab can turn into research tools, right? There's possibly media components or other things uh, that are additive to a process that Millipore might be able to, to turn around and uh, turn into a, a very lar large and lucrative uh, line of products. But then there's that base technology that could form the, the high value IP addition to a startup company. And so I think looking at all of our different lenses, you know, there's, there is that kind of know-how versus tangible material versus IP, patent formal IP. But I, I'd like to hear from Karen. Karen, like how, how important is the patent to, to your discoveries? Yeah, so it's definitely uh, great to have. And I, I, I do agree with you. There's different way of using your patents, uh, sometimes for the better, for the worse. So with us, our, this this our technology, the fluorescent RNA technology is called spinach, and then so Cornell pan all around the, the composition matter for the compound that this RNA need to use to to make it fluorescent, or the method of use, or even the application. So I think Cornell did a lot of huge pan uh, application for all of this, and we have the exclusive right for all the use. And then we, when we were exploring using spinach commercializing, we knew it could be a research tool. Eventually, maybe in diagnostic, eventually in manufacturing. So there's a lot of applications. And having a core technology that covers a lot of these usage is very helpful for us as we explore different areas because that might affect how we fund raise funding or even approach companies. And on the specific on the research tool side, we actually don't enforce as much because our RNA, as Jamie said, like we publish a lot because that's what scientists trust when they want to use the technology. So a lot of time we do publish our sequence, RNA sequence. So to encourage people to use our technology, they just have to buy the, the fluorescent for the, the fluorescent and die from us to, to use the technology together. So we get that, a revenue from that way. So from there, we actually encourage a lot, we publish a lot of sequences, but knowing that if a commercial entity want to use our technology for their initial product, they, we do have a patent, so they have to come to us. So we kind of kind of, kind of offer a, a lenient op open use for academics while kind of to build traction and then let the commercial entity come to us, knowing that we have a patent to, to help us commercialize that aspect. And as for know-how, we definitely, because we publish a sequence, we then most of our value comes from know-how. Having helper sequence around our RNA to make our RNA uh, for us more that other people doesn't know. So that way they do still have to come to us to do the custom service or to do like special designs or even like the buffer assay for a high frequent assay, screening with the buffer component, the workflow, how to develop this assay. They're all very important and actually more critical than just the sequence itself. So they. So that the know-how also is very critical, as you said. Yep, yep. Thank you for that perspective, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Carving out sort of the the commercial space, but in in um, the academic realm, obviously researchers need to use those tools as well. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, the strategy that you're using. Um, I'd like to move on now to some more of the tangible challenges. So we talked a little bit about. Um, the ownership and the intellectual property, which are sort of intangible challenges. Um, but now moving on to um, some of the more physical ones like quality control. Um, so one issue that uh, research tools face rather uniquely as opposed to something like a therapeutic are the quality of the material. And I know that ATCC and JAX, for example, both have a lot of measures for ensuring the quality and authenticity of their materials before they ship them out to researchers. Um, Peter and Chuck, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about some of the issues which arise regarding quality control of tangible materials um, and how do companies and biorepositories manage these? Chuck, do you want to go first? No, no I was going to defer to you. Okay. 
<laughs> you want me to go first? Okay, so with mice, there's there's two areas where this really comes into into play. The the first one is infectious agents. There's 45 different infectious agents we have to uh, quality control for mice, and continually test um, the mice to make sure they do not carry these agents. Also, a lot of mice are highly immune compromised to the, the type of research they're used in. So they have to be maintained in extremely clean and uh, regulated conditions in order to keep the, keep the, keep the mice uh, uninfected. The other one is the genetic issue. As a living organisms, they will uh, evolve genetically. And when mice come in, one of the first things we do is check the genome using a, a SNP panel, uh, 10,000 SNPs, I think, to uh, look for any of the common aberrations, and then we will breed them out. So the mice uh, backgrounds are uniform, and we know exactly what the mutations are as, as well as they can be defined as possible. And then we have to continually monitor them uh, to make sure there's not any changes on this. So it's uh, <clears throat> it's a big challenge, and it's it's something you can do relatively effectively at scale, uh, but on a on a smaller level in your own repository, it, it may be more difficult to keep that level of quality. <clears throat> And, and, and to, to toot our horns, I think Jackson Lab and ATCC are two of the kind of nonprofit repositories that spend most of our time in the R&D part of this, right? We are, we are both organizations dedicated to research and doing the investigation and development in-house. Now, ATCC is a little bit different in that we have a wide berth of different kinds of materials that we bring in. So we're in immortalized mammalian cell lines, we're in primary cells, we do parasitology and we do uh, all sorts of microbes. Um, ATCC is a standards organization. We work in uh, biomaterial standards. And one of the things that we struggle with uh, that, well, actually no, we are trying to help the biomedical research world with a struggle, which is when you have continuous cell lines that can be cultured for long periods of time, genetic drift and other things happen over time, right? And so it's incumbent upon biobanks and biorepositories to ensure that the materials that they have on hand are authenticated and are representative of whatever it is that the researcher is trying to test, right? And this is similar to what, what Peter was talking about with Jackson Labs, right? Those mice over time through breeding or through other kinds of, you know, just existence, things happen. And so there's got to be that ability to trace back to the original deposit or to the original creation. Otherwise, research becomes unmoored. The foundation gets lost. And so from that aspect, I think we serve a really important role from the quality control uh, perspective, which is researchers at a certain point, you can offload, right? And give it to a trusted repository to authenticate and then to biopreserve that specimen. So that as you do your work, you don't have to rely upon your 10, 15, 20, 30 year old frozen stocks, right? You can always come back to the biorepository to get something that is going to be as close as possible to the material that you deposited. And I think that's a, a great deal of value because that standardization effort really allows for a common playing field when we're trying to duplicate research. You know, this duplicate, this reproducibility issue is, you know, plaguing science. And uh, standards organizations have to play that role in helping the entire environment in the quality control issues. But I know that individual academic institutions also spend a lot of time thinking about these things with their own biobanks and biorepositories. So I think that there has to be a continuous conversation that's going. And I think a lot of that is happening through different kinds of standards organizations. So ANSI and other uh, member organizations do that. So if you have faculty or students who are interested in the standards world, uh, happy to talk about that. But yeah, quality control is ATCC wouldn't exist if it weren't for quality control issues. Yeah, great. That makes a lot of sense, and and certainly an interesting perspective. Um, I'm there are there is work being done at academic institutions, obviously for quality control, but there are considerable differences between the processes which you and Peter described um, and the academic processes for ensuring quality control. 
I guess, considering these differences, what are some of the strategies and methods which companies um, and organizations like Jackson ATCC use to ensure that academic reagents are commercially ready from a quality control perspective once they're transferred? Uh, from our perspective, we take it through its paces, right? So anything that you deposit or, you know, for th there's kind of a general deposit method that we use where you basically give it up to our scientists to assess the value and the importance of that line. And then we take it through a QC and a relatively expensive process to get it standardized and put into a biobank. And then when we internally license it, so there's a separate pathway for that where we see some sort of commercial need or some sort of institutional need for taking on the materials because they're going to be some, you know, a platform for us uh, in some strategically important area. Um, we won't sign the license unless we actually do our diligence first. Um, so there's up and down that kind of assessment. Uh, Peter, how about you at Jackson? Well, we, uh, we, we try to disclose as much information we have about uh, a mouse model and we'll have with detailed data sheets for every model and, and on there, any anomaly or uh, you know, unexpected genetic uh, feature of the mouse is, that we found is detailed. We'll also say, if there's any back crossing, any cleaning up, any um, uh, sort of genetic elements that had to be removed from the mouse, we will report that. And we may go back to the original investigator and say, okay, we got the mice from you, and now here they are from Jax. Uh, we're going to send them back to you, and you take another look at the phenotype and make sure that it's still consistent. Uh, it's, it's quite a long process. It can take years to get a mouse up to the standard where it can be released for distribution. Yeah, that makes a, a lot of sense. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to ask Jamie. Like, so Jamie, over over at um, at uh, Millipore, how much um, quality control of just testing the basic information or associated data to uh, a product that you in license? You know, I, I would assume that that's a huge diligence step for your licensing deals as well. Absolutely. And it's significant uh, what we do. Um, coming from a, a licensing background and coming into industry, I was I was just absolutely shocked about the amount of work that our, our R&D does in reproducing, validating what, what we're licensing. It's uh, it's incredible um, the amount of work that we do just to put a product on the market, which includes duplicating uh, a lot of the assays that are published in the paper. Um, and making sure it meets our our quality our quality standards. So it's significant. Um, we do hundreds of new agreements per year, and each each MPI, as we call it, or new product introduction, is validated by our team and goes through an extremely comprehensive vetting process. Yeah, and I guess that makes a lot of sense for sort of what's going on behind the scenes. I guess from the perspective. Um, of an academic center, we sort of see this in the way that it's built into our agreements in the validation period. Could you speak a little bit about um, what that looks like for researchers that are looking to license their materials to a company like Millipore? Um, what timelines and from an agreement perspective, what they can expect? Yeah, great question. So what, what we prefer to do, it doesn't necessarily have to be this way, but we prefer to do, and I would say 90% of our agreements fall, fall in this category where we just basically bake in uh, the license agreement. We pre-negotiate the terms and we bake in um, into the license agreement, a grace period where we receive the material and then validate them. And if it passes validation, then we pay the licensing fee or whatever is due. Um, whatever else is due. And then um, we, uh, if it does not pass validation, then we basically terminate the contract, but we like to do everything up front. Um, that's our preference. And the reason is, is, you know, I'd say, well, let's do a material transfer agreement. Um, and that's fine. And we do do that. But if we do the material transfer agreement, that means we're doing two agreements and it takes longer to, um, to validate and put the product on the market because you might receive the material on an MTA, but if we receive you know, additional material under the license that we're just going to test it again and it goes back to our rigorous quality control standards. So that's what our, our preference is. And I'd say 90% of our agreements have that. And, um, and that's our, that's our preferred way of doing it. 
And then I don't know, do you do you provide that feedback or or any other of the organizations that are doing this validation? Does that feedback get provided to researchers or does it sort of disappear into the ether? No, absolutely. Absolutely we do. We 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 um if it's not working, it's our it's our automatically we reach out to the researchers, the inventors to get their feedback and share the results with them. So it's just automatic. Um, whether or not they want to, you know, help us, that that's up to them. And they would not be contractually obligated to do so, but most times, you know, they do and they provide feedback. Oh, you know, you should have done this. You should have done that. So absolutely. I mean, we, we value that, uh, so much, uh, even when it works, we think it works. We reach out to them. We say, is this what you see? And so we, we want that from them. And it just goes back to, again, to our rigorous QC. Great. Yeah, thanks for that perspective. I think that speaks to the ways that researchers can work together with with companies to get these into the market. Um, I guess we're all fairly familiar with the traditional ways of getting tangible materials into the market, whether through a big company or through an ATCC or a JAX. Um, so we're also seeing that applications of research tools are constantly expanding besides the traditional licensing um, for animal model or cell work. What are some of the alternative ways that you all are seeing tangible materials being commercialized? Um, Chuck, I don't know if you want to speak to that. I think you've got some experience in that space, right? Yeah, and it's always fun when I start delving into this part of this because my brain could take us in all sorts of different directions. Because like, if you think about it, a biobank, especially like a repository like ours, it's really kind of like creating a commons, right? You're trying to put as many different kinds of tangible material developed by thousands and thousands of different researchers from different organizations under a common rule, right? To allow that material to be accessed. Um, you know, the, the whole thought behind that is that you have a single authentication point, single point of manufacture, but then on the end for the users, it's, oh, we know how to, to negotiate a deal with you guys, right? It's not gonna be a surprise with all sorts of other kinds of surprises hidden behind the surprise. But I'd say that there's lots of different ways that one could approach this, right? So if you think about it, that tangible material by itself could have some value, right? And then the associated data to that tangible material could have some value. In itself, it may have limited value. Right. Uh, it just depends upon what does that enable you to do if you were to pay the money to get access to that material or data. But there's obviously, you know, big data becomes a bigger play. Right. You know, for training AI or for doing all sorts of other things, having access, uh, being part of a bigger pool of information is 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 more valuable. And that's part of the, the, the play for for Jackson, for ATCC, for lots of different kinds of repositories where it's like, look, the individual material in vivo or in vitro, um, it's gonna play a role, but it's gonna have very, very directed use. Now, if you can move toward an in silica world, right? Where you're able to emulate or get you know, greater insights because of the background data or from the testing data, there's a lot of potential applications for that, especially, you know, you're seeing it with this whole a open AI monetization thing and whether that's even in the spirit of data and data sharing, but, I think that there's all of these different ways of kind of cutting it up, right? So, uh, you know, let's let's take, for instance, the kind of Lucerna um, example, right? You've got the spinach thing with its base technology and its IP that's so core to that company, right? And getting that exclusive license to it means that they can take on the expense of telling others back off, right? However, they could generate materials, right? Based off of that RNA technology, and then have limited licenses out. You know, it could even be non-exclusive licenses out for distributing the consumable part of it, retaining you know the rights for the platform to themselves, but being creative about splitting it up. And I think your faculty members could do similar things, right? There are the fundamental baseline, uh, fundamental technologies that they can develop, and those could be patents and they could be high-value things. But there's all sorts of research tools and data and other things, even the curriculum that they generate. Those under copyright can turn into commercializable uh, pieces of um, uh, intangible material. So I do think that there's a lot of different kinds of ways of thinking about the research products. 
uh, the, the end result of their research. Um, but that was me not talking about the ATCC mindset. It's just kind of letting my brain expand out. I'm interested to see what part of that the other participants will see value in expounding on. Yeah, Karen, so I don't I, know if you want to comment on on the aspect concerning Lucerna. Yeah, I mean, I almost feel like Chad is in that business meeting, it seems like. <laughs> so, but yeah, it, it, he was right. Like, so we have a core technology, so we sell research tools that people can buy, but we also, having that right, give us the right to distribute. So we do have non uh agreement with distributors, like company that sell products to distribute. And then we can also, we are in uh, talk with company that right now, as we know, mRNA vaccination is very big right now. It's a big market. And they need a way to image these vaccines, see how it's delivered to sell. So we are have a, 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 a current negotiation for them to in license the technology for their research use. So they can use it to whatever purpose, image RNA to see how it's delivered or the stability of these vaccines. So kind of using it for their own purpose. So basically they're in licensing a specific niche of application from us to do that in-house. So that's another aspect. So we can we can basically license a lot of different varieties. And also we, as we always think about how to commercialize our technology. That's why we develop a, a custom asset developed aspect. So company have, every single company has different need for their high throughput drug screens. So they'll come to us, tell us what they need to do and we will develop, we have a platform to develop a specific asset for them. So that's another way of kind of developing a, a, another different revenue stream for uh, around this technology. And lastly, so we got really good at making RNA and right now there's a lot of need. So we actually are now thinking about maybe we can leverage our facility or our work, our workforce know-how and now equipment to develop now the production of RNA just to, as, a, as a manufacturing uh, and additional manufacturing uh, applications. So just always a different way to see how can we use our core technology in as many purposes possible. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really interesting the way that data from the tangible materials as well as the know-how and the manufacturing methods all are, are valuable in their own way and can be applied to different applications. Um, Peter, I don't know if you want to comment on anything that JAX is doing with the, the vast amount of data that you have. Well, there's, there's a couple of areas. Uh, one, one is um, relatively simple. It's, it's a phenotype database, and it's, it's all the data organized when a mouse model is treated with a, a certain compound or conditions, uh, how it reacts. You know. And this, this can be hugely valuable if you consolidate this data. You'll get a range of reactions across uh, different mouse models, and people can use that to sort of jumpstart their experiments and start off further down the track otherwise than they would have been. And this is all placed in the public domain, and it can add a lot of value to the mouse models. The other one is... Um, uh, the sort of bigger uh, aspect of data science, and this is something we are moving into. We're going to have a data science uh, institute that's uh, currently ramping up. And they would be doing things like, instead of using uh, the mouse or even the DNA, you'll look at the sequence data and you'll start your experiment there and you interrogate that and then try and sort of back up from there and get to the types of models and the experiments you should be doing. But it's very much uh, an in silico proposition to get as far as you can before you start using uh, the biomaterials of the live animals. Yeah, I think that's really interesting and really creative ideas for using the tools and the data. Maybe we can give our researchers some different ideas of how they can use their own models and materials. Um, so I want to also talk about briefly um, the value to researchers. So given that there are many opportunities for commercialization of tangible materials, which we just outlined a, a few of the different applications besides the traditional ones, I'd love to touch on the value and enrichment that commercializing research tools can also bring to an investigator's research. Um, so considering the value that academics bring to commercial entities through these research tools, what are some of the ways that value is shared back with researchers and institutions, uh, both in monetary and non-monetary um, instances? Yeah, yeah, thanks. I can I can comment on the on the non-monetary. I think, you know, first is, you know, requests, especially going back to whether or not it's been published with a lot of requests, then you wouldn't necessarily have to send it to, you know, labs and you know other parts of the world or anybody anybody at all. And so you can always direct them towards, you know, our our company website uh for for requests. I think 
the fact that uh, people can buy, then they can publish and, you know, they can cite either us as the source or perhaps maybe your own lab as a source for that. And in terms of, you know, monetary, um, you know, gain for your lab. So, yeah, haven't, haven't done this for the past 16 years. So I have a lot of these conversations and have come to know, you know, certain things that I think are useful for this, for this conversation. And one of those is, is that, you know, uh, licensing your reagents to, you know, to a company for them to distribute, you know, you do get some, uh, you know, licensing fees and royalties back. Now, what that is, you know, it all depends upon the nature and the scope of, of the opportunity. But what I, what I have been told over the years is that researchers, you know, like to out-license their uh, reagents to companies because whatever money that they're getting back, whatever that is, um, they can use for, you know, discretionary uh, purposes, say, for example, holiday parties or birthday parties or new computers. They tell me that's what I use the money for. Um, or even in some cases, they pay people in their lab based on the royalties that they that they get. This is not here in the U.S., but somewhere somewhere in Europe. So, you know, so that's, you know, an important thing. And if you're considering licensing your, your reagents, it's an important question to ask is, you know, what, what am I getting back? And each institution has their own policies. I don't know what what Cornell's is. You can, you know, ask, ask offline about that. But, um, you know, based on experience, the institutions that do the most licensing to us are, are ones where they're, they're the most generous of what they what they give give back to the labs in terms of the, the royalty share. It's probably not 100 at Cornell or anybody else for that matter, but no matter what it is, you you get something back. And so, you know, it becomes a, a recurrent recurrent stream for for your lab. So that's just something that, you know, I've, I've learned. I've learned through the years. Right. Yeah, yeah thank think, you. Go ahead, Chuck. Sure. Sorry. Just I, I don't do well with awkward si uh, pauses. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that there's the carrot parts of this. Right. So royalties are are, you know, a nice thing to have, right? It's a quid pro quo. Um, there's a couple of the stick parts that I think it's important to note, right? Which is like, you know, there's patenting and publication policies where you have to deposit your materials to kind of enable the, the research to be duplicated. Also, you know, because I'm a tech transfer person, there's a whole Bidol uh, requirements where if you take federal funds, you know, if you got one of those NIH grants, you have to make those research tools available in order to kind of maximize the utility of those research tools to the research community. But then there's the, the other part of this, which, which Jamie kind of touched on, which is, all right, you have this tangible material in your laboratory. If your lab's going to keep working on it, you're going to keep, you know, either continuously culturing it or find frozen stocks or find some way to kind of do that. But there is a value to offloading that, right? Having a biorepository handle that, you know, takes away the whole packaging and shipping part of it, right? That's not really why you have your laboratory personnel in-house really to spend a lot of time on that. ATCC and other global biorepositories have that supply chain expertise for getting the materials, authenticating it, and then shipping it to people all over the world. Um, the way we also approach it is it's really about authenticating and preserving your legacy, right? Like it's these, these research tools are foundational to some sort of discovery, some sort of utility and depositing it. And I would say like, if you're going to deposit it, deposit it at, at as many repositories as will take it because these are all non-exclusive things. And each repository is going to try to keep an authenticated line. And it'd be interesting to see how much they diverge right over time. But that value to yourself in making sure that your research tools can be widely accessible and used can then enable the next discoveries that are going to come. There's so, you know, science is just about iteration. It's about that, that wonderful amalgamation that happens over time. And so I really do think that that tangible benefit of royalties also results in the tangible, the, the intangible benefit of knowledge spillover, right? your materials can then go down into future publications, future discoveries that are going to benefit the world. Yeah, all I can do is agree with both of you, really. We have found that the, the biggest value add for, um, for mice is the, the publication. And then after it's published, 
making it available to other researchers so they can continue to publish and uh, and work with the material. And this this is the one big factor that uh, that, that that makes your your um, biomaterial important. It's getting it out there and, and getting it out there in a consistent fashion. Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense and gives perspective as to why it's really valuable beyond the mon potential monetary value. Um, I know, Karen, you worked closely with your your lab that you came out of even after you um, left for Lucerna. Would you like to talk a little bit about um, the value of maintaining contact with the lab and commercializing the research tool? Yeah, absolutely. So there's two things. There's the model, there's the value part, which is that we have worked with like with the Jaffe Lab on this like a sponsor research agreement that that type of thing. So you can do you can sponsor research well with them to do a very specific development, as well as when we we had to do a lot of kind of we do a lot of QC back to the QC question. So we had to do a lot of back end to make sure what what are we develop the customer can use every single time. So a, a, a good product, something that can, that works every single time. So we had to do a lot of back end validation, a lot of back end, even building out the fertile technology to be more robust. And those information we share with my my uh the, the old lab. So that way we can we can let them know what improvement we like we have work worked know how that we have found that was useful, then then they can use that. So that way their researcher does not have to do that kind of that that more the less glamorous part of research. Can they focus on publishing publishing uh interesting research? Well we could do the, the more boring part, but develop the technology further for both of our purposes. Mm -hmm. So it's a mutual beneficial knowledge sharing that we do. Yeah, Karen, thanks for that perspective. Um so I want to briefly touch on sort of a future trends and where the fields is going and where we expect to be to see how tangible materials are commercialized in the coming years. So I guess to all of you, what are some of the trends that you're seeing in tangible com commercialization um, and where do you think the field is going? Peter, I know that you have some thoughts on this. Right. The, the big thing we've been working on in this area is trying to change the way that institutions license mice. The sort of classical way of doing it is you send the company back to the institution, they negotiate and they end up with one license agreement for one mouse for a period of time. What we're trying to do is use one consistent license and have that um, uh, signed by the company and then put many mice into it. So instead of annual fees, you'll include the uh, royalty in the cost of each mouse purchased and used. And of course, there's some uh, additional pieces to that, but that's the basic idea. And we found this to be far more productive and effective in getting mice into the hands of uh, companies to research use. Uh, of the royalties we collect, we return 80% at least to the institution uh, in, in each case. So it should, um, uh, it, it definitely does meet the needs of the companies. They don't want to spend a lot of time negotiating tangible material licenses if they don't have to. It's it's kind of a one and done because you can scale it to any number of mice. And we think it will be more effective in providing efficient uh, tangible property licenses to the uh, institutions that provide the mice. That's our experience to date. Yep, yep. I think that makes a lot of sense. And then I guess any other trends as far as either the regulatory environment or um, any other places that you think the field are going? Chuck, I think I you had some thoughts on this. Sure. So I'm really um, spending a lot of time thinking about uh, the movement away from animal models. So sorry, Peter. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, the EU setting a, a very aggressive timeline of, of moving away from all animal testing in 2030 in certain fields. And there are lots of other things that are happening. Uh, in the U.S., there are certain trends that, that one should follow where you're seeing this kind of move toward better in vitro models. Right. And you can see this in all a, a lot of different other industries, too. There are these trends that are happening from the regulatory, from the government side. And then there's also these kind of tech push trends that are happening where companies and, and society as a whole are saying like, hey, this is a benefit to move this direction. For instance, like the three R's, which is about 
uh, reducing animal testing from a kind of compassion and environmental sensitivity. And so that means like if you're working with cell lines or with organoids or these uh, micro uh, fluidic devices where you can create these kind of organs on chips, there's, there's so much uh, emulation that, that needs to happen to kind of say like this in vitro result is, is uh, emulating that in vivo thing that you're testing. But it all contributes to that big data pool, right? And that big data pool then can lead to that in silica testing world. And so I think that it's, it's a super exciting, but also a very confusing time to be a tech transfer professional, right? Because you're seeing this like whole thing about the common pool of information is where the value is. The, the more that you work on these in vitro models where, you know, from an ATCC perspective, we want to be agnostic to the actual technological platform. How does it engineer? We don't really care. What we want is we want models that can be used on every device, right? And so it's almost like this kind of moving toward a common set of standards of materials. And this is going to impact all sorts of companies and all sorts of ways that we work as a, as a research community. And so I think that's that it's, it's really, really interesting because the tech isn't going to drive it. It's actually going to be the enablement of the base materials and consumables that are going to drive that uniformity. So that's a future trend that I'm excited about. Yeah, yeah. I'll also certainly be interested to see where that goes in the next few years. Um, I just quickly want to get to um, some Q&A before we have to wrap up. So if you have any additional questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A chat. Um, this one is for you, Chuck. Um, it's very common for investigators to modify cell lines obtained from ATCC. I think this is also true for Jack's mice. Um, and how should researchers try to work with ATCC to commercialize them? Yeah, so we do all of our distribution through an MTA, and those MTA terms spell out exactly what uh, the end user can and can't do with it. And so modifications, making it is, you know, very common. Um, now, the question becomes, what do you want to do with that modification, right? Do you want to deposit it back at ATCC? Because, you know, we'll accept it. Um, but if you're interested in commercializing it, there's that negotiation that your tech transfer office is going to have to do, where in any commercialization that follows on has to have the rights of the original materials. It's that stickiness of these um, tangible material conversations. So uh, you can reach out to our contracts team or you can have your tech transfer office do that, you know, because that's their that's their job. I like tech transfer offices having spent many years doing it. You know, they're the office of yes. You can think up all sorts of scenarios and they'll find a way to make it happen. So even on this very easy thing, you know, use your tech transfer office. We, we have mechanisms for just easily accomplishing what you need. Yes, I echo that. Please contact us. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I think with that, we're just about at time. Um, I want to thank the participants and also the panelists for your participation um, and all of our attendees for joining. Um, so we host lots of programming and events through CTL Enterprise Innovation. So please check out our events calendar if you're interested in similar plan, uh, programming. Also, if you have certain topics which you are interested in learning more about, please let us know. We're always happy to ensure that our programming is relevant and engaging for all of our stakeholders. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the panel and came away with something new to think about or even an idea for a tangible material or research tool in your lab. If you do and you would like to speak to CTL, please feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to connect in further depth. Um, but yeah, thank you all today. Yeah, thank you for having us. And then I feel like if people have a question about further about commercialization, I'm happy to talk to anybody further about this, their questions. Great. Thank all right, you all. Thank you all. Thank have you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.